Hey guys, welcome to Real English. In these videos, I take you around Edinburgh while I tell you some of its amazing history and you get to learn some fantastic English language in context. Today, it's part three of Marie de Guise's story and the last part, I promise, I will keep holding out on you. So let's dive in to the end of the story of this incredible woman. The Scots took another battering from the English, this time in the borders. Henry tried to go directly to King Francois, offering to give back the recently captured city of Boulogne if France would put pressure on Scotland to marry Mary to Edward. Meanwhile, in the Scottish court, Cardinal Beaton had been sent away after coming to blows with a French ally. Beaton, a Catholic priest, was becoming increasingly unpopular with the growing Protestant faction. He perfectly represented the power-hungry and arrogant papal priest. Beaton was corrupt and a hypocrite, and it was unsurprising he was unpopular, especially with his love for burning heretics. When he executed the Protestant reformer George Wishart, things really came to a head. The obvious pleasure he got in burning heretics really didn't help either. Protestant rebels sneaked into his castle in St Andrews and while Beaton screamed, you cannot slay me, I'm a priest, he was murdered. His body was hung from a window of the castle and eventually his body was put into a salt chest and thrown into a dungeon where he had kept many Protestant prisoners. Although he was extremely unpopular, the brutality of his murder really shocked the country and Marie would certainly miss his skill of bringing people together and negotiating truces. Henry VIII, however, down in England, was delighted because it removed one of the biggest opponents of his treaty. It did not, however, stop the French alliance. Protestant rebels barred themselves in the castle and a long siege did little to stop them. Because St Andrew's Castle is on the sea, Henry was easily able to send supplies from England. It was also going to be the birthplace of the real Protestant revolution in Scotland because one of those rebels was a guy you might have heard of called John Knox. That's a story for another time. Scotland was still mainly a Catholic country at this point, and the Scots were more concerned about the English helping the Protestant rebels. They saw them as unpatriotic and preferred to side with the French. The siege lasted for over a year, during which two very important things happened. Number one, Henry VIII died and Lord Somerset, the man who had been responsible for the recent invasions in Scotland, took over control until the new king came of age. He made it clear that he would be continuing to pursue the treaties. Number two, King Francois over in France also died, making King Henri a childhood friend of Marie's, the new French monarch. Marie's connection to the new king in France meant that Henri quickly sent French galleys over to St Andrew's Castle, ending the siege in six days. Lord Arran, embarrassed that Marie managed to achieve in six days what he hadn't in over a year, knew that he would soon challenge him for the regency. Somerset was furious. He took a new approach of invading Scotland and establishing garrisons. Scotland was once again thrown into violence. At the Battle of Pinkie in Musselburgh, it was an absolute massacre for the Scots. Although initially looking like it might be a win for the country, of the 12,000 troops that Scotland had, 10,000 were estimated to be killed and 2,000 taken prisoner. This left the road to Stirling clear, where the young queen was. Marie saw the increased danger her daughter was in, so she stepped up her mission to get a French match. And she was amazed to learn that the French crown prince, the Dauphin, had been offered in marriage. 
She knew that this would not be popular in Scotland. It would be seen as French involvement, but she saw no other option. Once again, the useless Aaron was a spanner in the works, as he wanted his son to marry Mary. So to get him out the way, the French offered him a dukedom and a very advantageous and rich marriage. The French-Scottish alliance was agreed, and France sent troops. Being a very practical woman, Marie took the policy of if you want something done well, you got to do it yourself. Both the French and Scottish soldiers who were stationed in Edinburgh seemed more interested in hanging around the city than actually doing any work. Marie took it upon herself to personally go and visit the soldiers in their houses to motivate them to get ready to fight. This saw the first steps of her becoming a constant presence in the camps. Charming the soldiers and reminding the French ones of her father and her brothers, inspiring the same levels of loyalty and devotion. On the 29th of July, 1548, Marie parted with her fifth child. Remember, at any point during this, she could have gone back to France, lived with her kids and had a nice, quiet, relaxing life. But she chose to stay and fight. Marie was left to continue the fight with the English, as well as controlling the tensions of the people of Edinburgh with the marauding French troops who weren't used to the significantly stronger Scottish alcohol. She also had to deal with Aaron, now Duke of Châtellerault, who was trying to make his family as rich as possible from Scotland's treasury before he was kicked out as regent. On top of all of that, Lord Somerset had made it clear that despite Mary being in France, he was going to press on with his plans of conquering Scotland. In September 1549, a treaty was eventually signed between Scotland, England and France. But Scotland's finances and future were unstable. Marie decided to take advantage of this brief, peaceful moment to sail to France and get financial and military help from King Henri. She very cleverly took English-leaning Scottish nobles with her. So the king could grease their palms with generous pensions and be generally wowed by the glamorous sophistication of the French court. She managed to get King Henri to commit to financing Scotland's recovery, promising military support and making her regent. This was despite his advisers pushing for a French nobleman for the job, which they saw unsuitable for a woman even a woman like Marie. Staying in France for over a year, she got to visit her former homes and spend time with her two living children. She could have stayed in France, but she chose to return and govern Scotland. She had planned to return in the spring of 1551, but news of a plot to poison her daughter delayed her. The thought that her daughter wouldn't even be safe in France sent her to her bed for days. She eventually got ready to set sail in September and her now 16-year-old son, Francois, accompanied her on the journey to her ship. He was old enough to now be able to go and visit his mother whenever he pleased. But, as we know in the story, good times don't last long. He fell ill on the journey and was forced to take to his bed. Marie kept vigil by his side until the 22nd of September, when he died. Despite having just lost her fourth child, she decided that instead of going straight to Scotland, she would take advantage of the current peace with England and pay a diplomatic mission to the king. She got back to Scotland and set about sorting out the country. By this point, King Edward had died, and the death of the king meant that England wouldn't be a threat for Scotland for some time, while he worked out who would be his successor. Due to generous financial incentives, she finally managed to get rid of Châtelet. And on Thursday, 12th of April, 1554, she was officially made regent of Scotland. She set about modernising the country. Châtellerault had left her with a deficit of over £30,000. Her own income couldn't possibly cover this. So she made prudent financial decisions, stopped all renovations on royal residences, sold her own belongings and cut down on her household expenses. She set about implementing reforms to fix the country. And here are some of the things that she put through. She stopped incessant fighting between noble families, especially in the north of the country. And she did this by centralising government. This government would decide on law and order instead of relying on individual families to decide things as they saw fit. This would stop infighting, make the country more unified and avoid external threats. The country was starving, so she knew that she had to improve food security. She imposed harsh penalties on poachers or those stealing from beehives or other acts that might harm the food supply. Farmers were encouraged to increase their flocks of sheep and forbidden 
to sell sheep at market, as that was in particular short supply. It was also forbidden to slaughter lambs for three years. Export of meat in general was strictly controlled, and exports of animal products like wool and leather totally banned. Trees, after the forests had been decimated to grow ships, were protected and allowed to grow. And she spent time travelling around the country and giving verdicts in local courts. She often gave fines instead of the death penalty, which made her merciful, but also increased the wealth of the treasury. She wanted to return a sense of national pride and normalcy to the people of Scotland. And while France saw Scotland as a future satellite state for the country, Marie certainly did not. She wanted to keep those strong connections with France, but more importantly, she wanted to protect her daughter's inheritance with everything that she had. She took no lovers, and even John Knox, who couldn't stand her, wasn't able to prove any kind of affair, although he did try to suggest that something had gone on with Cardinal Newton. Clearly untrue. During all of this, the Protestant Reformation was starting to gain popularity. Marie was a very tolerant monarch and allowed all of her subjects to worship any way they wanted to, but she drew the line at iconoclasm. When the Protestant mob started to destroy icons in the churches, she began to reconsider her neutral stance. It was growing clear that this was less to do with Protestantism and more to do with a group trying to stir up trouble. To make matters worse, Catholic Queen Mary in England had died and her Protestant half-sister Elizabeth had taken the throne. Mary began to face continued resistance from the more militant Scottish Protestants who saw England as a much better ally than France. The reappearance of John Knox in Scotland and Queen Elizabeth getting rid of the Catholic faith in England only made matters worse. The group of Scottish Protestants, now calling themselves the Congregation, continued to gather strength throughout the country. Marie saw herself quickly losing allies at court and becoming more and more powerless. Knox gave sermons denouncing Marie and the French alliance and the Congregation grew in power. As Marie was forced to retreat, it was clear this wasn't about religious tolerance because Marie had never persecuted Protestants. What was happening was the pursuit of religious freedom was being used as an excuse to end Marie's regency and to end the French presence in Scotland. Marie was getting increasingly ill. The stress of fighting her corner was being made worse by a heart condition she'd suffered from all of her life. Seeing that things were going from bad to worse, she managed to get into Edinburgh Castle in a last-ditch attempt to contact her allies. But all of this was in vain. The Protestant rebels were being funded by English gold. In 1560, the Treaty of Berwick was signed, where the English promised to send troops to get rid of the French, end the old alliance, and finish with Marie's regency. The congregation didn't trust her. She was a woman and a foreigner. They wouldn't even send any members of their group to speak to her in case she bewitched them with her womanly wiles. All of her reforms were viewed as a way to destroy Scottish identity. And everything that she did to try and improve the country, the treasury, the food supply, was seen as a way of just making Scotland better for the French when they would eventually take over. Her health worsened severely over the next few weeks and it was clear that her time was coming out. Her ambitious brothers in France had failed to come to her aid. She was ill, lame, exhausted and bloated to the point of being unrecognisable from congestive heart failure. And on the 7th of June when she was so ill she could no longer lie down, she met one last time with the lords of the congregation to try and persuade them to reject the alliance with England. She addressed each one of them in turn, begging them to put their faith in France, telling them that everything she had done had been for the benefit of Scotland, not France, and that their true loyalty must lie with Mary. She then began to cry as she said her goodbyes, making the lords cry too, asking them for forgiveness for any offence she had caused since she had arrived in Scotland, and offering her forgiveness too. What a class act of a lady. She died just after midnight on the 11th of June, 1560. Beside her were not her family, but instead two lords of the congregation and two of her biggest enemies. She wasn't allowed to be buried beside James. So for a long time, her embalmed body just lay in its coffin in Edinburgh Castle while they worked out what to do with it. She was eventually taken to France and buried in the convent of one of her sisters. When her daughter Mary heard the news, she was distraught and it took months to recover from it. Marie de Guise's ultimate downfall was her gender, but what she achieved for her time was remarkable. The fact that she sacrificed her family for her regency suggests that such a shrewd, clever woman saw an opportunity to use her mind for great things. Historically, her daughter has been said not to have inherited this shrewdness. I think that's debatable. But what I can definitely agree with is that she definitely inherited her mother's spirit. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Real English. Bye!